Fellowship Hall. Sunday, March 31st. Now, this is a bit of a change, so please, if you haven't taken notice of the change in schedule for Easter Sunday, first off, the day starts at 7 a.m. at Town Stage with a combined sunrise service. I don't know how many churches are involved, but several. Then there's breakfast in the Fellowship Hall at 8 a.m., and here's where the changes really start. Sunday school is at 9 a.m. You know, we've got you here, and we fed you at 8, so we're just going to get you into Sunday school. And then worship service is at 10 a.m., which means, you know, your, your, your day is just a little bit different. So don't come at 11 just to worship service because you'll be missed things. All right, looking down below, you'll see your reminder for the 40 days of prayer for the church week. So please continue to pray for the pastor selection committee. They, I can tell you they're busy meeting and working. Um, to place a place an order for uh, Easter lilies, please call the Troy Flower Shop. The number is listed there. Make check payable to Troy Flower Shop, cost $20. Orders must be received by March the 26th. Lilies we placed in the sanctuary by uh, March the 29th. And it's got 22 there. I think that means to be 24. Uh, also, please remember to bring some flowers for decorating the cross on Easter Sunday morning. So that would be March the 31st. Taking a look at your prayer list. Please continue to remember Joanne Hill, who is at Claps Convalescent Home. Jano Lewis, who is at Seven Lakes Assisted Living. Graduates and colleges, military and missionaries serving around the world. The VBS Committee, Kids Club Workers. Uh, the Constitution Committee has completed their task. Thank you for their, your prayers. Or I mentioned the Pastor Selection Committee, uh, United States of America, national, state, local leaders. Church members at home. Buddy and Debbie Walzer, Ernest and Rosa Haywood, Evie Poole, Frederick and Myra Taylor, Grace Cruz, Judy Harden, Mac and Buffa Bowie, Richard Blake, Robert and Cindy Lyles, Ruth McIntosh, Sharon Matheny, Sheridan McIntosh, Sissy Allen, Teresa Haywood, Will and Faye Atkinson. Hope everyone has a great week. I do have one more special announcement. Um, uh, for those of you that don't know, Jocelyn's leading a senior in high school ladies and young adult ladies Bible study, and she had a lot of older ladies interested as well. So there is going to be, uh, Christine is going to be leading that on the same night, correct, that you are. And uh, she's our AMS, um, Andy Prince's wife. I think that stands for Association Mission Strategist, I believe. But uh, his w wife will be leading for the older ladies. I'm not going to be the one that checks IDs to see who goes to the young ones and who goes to the old ones. It's going to be somebody much more tougher and more muscular than me. But um, So if you are an older lady, like I said, I'm not going to check your ID. But you are able to come to um, that and young ladies too. So basically it's just open to all ladies. How about that? Sorry, man. All right, now, guys, are you ready to worship today? Today is a good day because I think the TVs are working. I think. So if you would, today, just stand and worship. Hey, there's nothing like the love of Jesus, so let's sing about it.
I know As he loved so long ago Taking children on his knee time you may be seated and we are going to collect our offering at this time and if you are a first time visitor please fill out that yellow card if you haven't already and just fill that out and place that in the offering plate as they come around this morning we are so thankful to have you here to worship with us at Troy First Baptist Church this morning and at this time we will bless the offering bow with me father god we thank you so much god for this opportunity lord to just come in your house what a beautiful day it is god what a what a just time to be together, Lord, the, the unity and, and God, just to be able to to just come in here and Lord, freely just open your word, God. And, and Lord, I just pray today, Lord, uh, that your presence fill the room, God. I, I just pray, God, that you take this humble offering we're giving, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you just take it and just multiply the gospel on the world, Lord. We know 
that we can never measure up to what you've given us, Lord. But God, we do pray that you take and you get the glory, Lord, from our offerings today. And God, it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. stand as we sing our next song this morning.
see it you're working even when i feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when serve a miracle working God. Hey, I don't really care what you're going through this morning. I just pray that today we can just give it to the Lord and worship and praise because He is mighty and He is good always. Let's worship Him this morning. Amen. Thank you. Let's give him a clap of praise this morning. This time, children, you are dismissed to elevate at this time. And the rest of you may be seated at this time. We have Brother Pastor Mark Mowbray going to come up and give the word of God. So, brother, at this time, you come on and you just give us what the Lord's laid on your heart. All right, well, greetings from the other side of the river, and uh, it's good to be with you in the Lord's house this morning. So thankful for every privilege that He gives us to hear and proclaim His Word. If you have your copy of God's Word, will you turn with me, please, to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 2 this morning. I'll begin reading in verse 23 in just a moment. It was May 23rd, 1939. A diesel electric submarine called the USS Squalus set out on its first voyage from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. As it made its way out into the Atlantic Ocean, suddenly and without warning, there was a system wide power failure, and the submarine sank to the bottom of the ocean, some 240 feet below. Trapped inside were 33 men in total darkness. Their oxygen supply was running out. But as you might expect, they did get off a May Day call. So a rescue vessel was sent to the site where the squalus went down. A diver with special gear was sent down to where the submarine rests upon the ocean floor. And inside, those 33 men could hear the metal boots of the diver hitting the side of the vessel. They knew that someone was out there. So they began to take a wrench and hit the side of the vessel to send a message in Moore's code. The diver heard the tapping and began to decode the message. Over and over again, the 33 men kept tapping the same thing. This was the message the diver heard. Is there any hope? Is there any hope? I believe that many people are asking that same question today concerning our nation, concerning the world. Every day we see and hear the reports of one crisis, one tragedy after another. We all are aware of the immorality and division that are striking all of our cities. And in almost every situation, people are crying out for help. 
wanting someone or something to place their hope in. You know, it wasn't very long ago that all of us received the alarming news of a fast-spreading virus. COVID-19 cases were reported everywhere. The world was put on lockdown. Then the news channels began to report of the possibility of a vaccine, which brought a glimmer of hope to some people, even though the vaccine wasn't here yet. Then came the vaccine, or vaccines. But yet, we were still told that even with the vaccine, since the vaccines were not 100% effective, we would still need to wear masks and social distance with the vaccine. And we all know where that's led to, right? One booster shot after another. Many are hoping that this November will bring about change. What if it doesn't? What if your political party doesn't win and things get worse? Where's your next glimmer of hope going to come from then? The good news is, church, our hope was never in a vaccine, nor in ever seeing another corona-type virus, nor is our hope in a political party. Church, our hope is, always has been, always will be in the Lord and in the Lord alone. The Lord is our only hope. Is the message I have for you this morning. And there's a word at the end of Exodus chapter 2 that reminds us of that very truth. Moses has found out who he is. A Hebrew who has killed an Egyptian. And he runs away and finds himself in Midian. Meanwhile, tucked away right here, beginning in verse 23, the story in Egypt continues. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage, and they cried out. And their cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. God was Israel's only hope. They didn't know it. They had to be told time and time again of that truth. Sound familiar? Israel was growing in number under this maniacal king who was bent on the destruction of all Israel. And we see that in the previous chapter as he instructed the Hebrew midwives to kill all of the male babies that were being born. And so, you might think that after this evil king had died, well, there'd be some sense of hope that things might get a little better. Some of you may be thinking the same thing concerning some of the leaders in our own nation. But the exact opposite is true in this story. Again, notice verse 23, it begins by saying, in the process of time, which would indicate to us that many days were passing. Many years later, okay, how many years later? How many days pass? The author is referring to the days in which we are reminded to in this story. Beginning, what leads up to it, and what we've just mentioned. It also introduced this to this maniacal king. But there's another character the story introduces us to. A hopeful character. A baby who's been sent away by his Hebrew mother in a basket down the river. 
And lo and behold, he's rescued by Pharaoh's own daughter. Then he makes his way into Pharaoh's house. You know the story. And as we read the story, we might sense that somehow there's hope in this one. But then that one in whom we're putting our hope in leaves. Despair enters because we thought certainly God is going to deliver His people. You can see where the story is going. One of God's own people is rescued from the murderous king and then ends up in the house of the murderous king. Certainly God will cause him to rise up in that house and gain power and then use that power that he has in that house to deliver God's own people. Oh God, you are such a wise God to put Moses in Pharaoh's... Wait, what? Moses is gone. The previous king is dead. Now meet the new one. He's not like the old one. He's worse. And now there is hopelessness. You know, in many ways, this text is a tale of two perspectives. Two perspectives. The first verse, verse 23, is about the perspective from the earth. Earth's perspective. Again, verse 23, now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. And remember, all of the other things that were just mentioned that happened, uh, basically hope rising in a coming deliverer and then hope being diminished because the deliverer has gone. Does that sound familiar? Fast forward some 1,500 years where Jesus and his disciples are sitting in an upper room on the eve of his crucifixion. They're thinking one thing, but Jesus has told them something else. Their hope was rising in Jesus to be the king who will deliver them from Roman oppression. Even though Jesus had told them time and time again, I'm going to Jerusalem and there I'll be going to a cross to be crucified. His message was, I'm not going to deliver you from Roman rule. I'm going to deliver you from sin's rule. So their hope was rising, but then as he goes to the cross and is crucified, their hope is diminished because their deliverer is gone. Then notice again in verse 23 that it says, the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out for help. You see, that's earth's perspective. Things are bad down here and they may get worse. And it may cause us, tempt us to have no hope at all. The only thing worse than bondage and slavery is death itself. And these Hebrew slaves were being pursued to death. But then there's another statement, or there's a statement in the middle of the two perspectives. At the end of verse 23, it says, And their cry came up to God because of their bondage. You see, we know what's going on down here on the ground, earth's perspective. But we didn't know it. They didn't know it. Their cry had gone up to God in his throne, on his throne, in his abode, to where God resides. The statement introduces us to the second perspective, God's perspective. And keep in mind, nothing has changed down here on the ground. As a matter of fact, nothing will change for quite some time. But for now, the writer is at least letting us, the reader, know God's perspective. Aren't you glad that the writers of the Bible let us know, let us in on God's perspective? What God is thinking, what God says, what God says about the future, what God says about you and me and himself. That's God's perspective. Same thing happens today. When we put our eyes on the earth, the things going on in the world around us, we forget about the one who's in charge of everything. 
God's perspective begins there in verse 24. Again, notice, God heard their groaning. And God remembered His covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Four verbs that point us to, that remind us of the hope that we have in our Lord. These four words teach us something, church, about the Lord and why He is our only hope. First of all, God heard their groaning. God heard their groaning. He is a God who hears. There is hope, church, in a God who hears. There's a couple of things we learn from this. For one, it teaches, it teaches us that the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is distinguished from the gods, the idols of Egypt. Listen to what the writer of Psalm 115 says concerning those days. The psalmist in 115 begins, he starts out by saying in verse 1, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because of your mercy, because of your truth. Why should the Gentiles say, so where is their God? For our God is in heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. Amen to that. And then here's the distinction I want you to see from the one true living God and the idols in Egypt. Remember, God heard. They're in the land of idols, the land of Egypt. So the psalmist continues in verse 4. Listen to this. He's describing the Egyptian idols. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not talk. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but they do not smell. Hands, but they do not handle. Feet, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. And so is everyone who trusts in them. Simply because there's no hope in idols. But Israel's God heard. That's good news for God's people because... Whenever we find ourselves in situations where we lack hope or our hope is lacking, one of the things we're tended, we have a tendency to do is to doubt God's care for us. We doubt that God's paying attention to us. So the statement God heard confronts that immediate fear that rises up within us that says, we have no hope. Or the fear that tells us that we must look around for something or someone else to place our hope in. We doubt God's care for us. We fear for the worst. We turn or we're tempted to turn from following God. That's the picture of the Hebrews here in this story. Once they're delivered, once they get into the wilderness, oh, I wish we were back in Egypt eating leeks and onions. All because we do not hold on to the truth of God's Word. And because we don't see the reality from God's perspective. We're so busy looking from, at it from Earth's perspective. All we look at and listen to is what's happening down here on the ground. The voices on the ground. Hello, I know I'm connecting with someone this morning because I am tempted to go through this myself. Moses wants us to know that even in the darkest of days, when no one knew what God was up to, God was listening and God heard. Church, the Bible makes it clear that God hears us when we cry out to Him. Other passages of Scripture, Psalm 55, verse 17, Proverbs verse 5, chapter 15, verse 29, 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15, all of these verses clearly tell us and teach us of God hearing His people when we cry out to Him. Church, it is an absolute privilege 
to be heard by God. And let me say this. If you have to read the remainder of the verse in order to have hope, well, you've missed it. You've already missed it. Because if all we had was the first few words of verse 24, it'd still be good news. If all we had were the words, and God heard their cry, that's good news. Some of you may be thinking at this time, I hear what you're saying, preacher, but you just don't know. You have no idea. I've been praying and praying and praying for God to do something in my life or someone's life and he still hasn't heard me. If that's you, you better stop. You better put it in reverse. You better ask God to forgive you because of what you are doing is you're contradicting the Bible. You say, how's that? Well, first of all, the Bible says God hears when his children cry out to him, but you're saying he doesn't. Even more significant than that, How arrogant do we have to be to assume that if God heard me, he would have answered by now and I would have known it because he would have done what I asked him to do. Who do we think we are to judge whether or not God heard us by whether or not he followed through with what we cried out in our request? It's a privilege to be heard by God. I didn't say it's a privilege for God to answer the very thing that we ask Him to do when He heard us. I said it is a privilege. The hearing in and of itself is a privilege. Listen, whatever it is you may be going through right now in your life that's troubling you, that's hurting you, that's causing you pain and suffering, always remember these two things. Number one, it's temporary. It won't last forever. This too will pass. It's temporary. And second, whatever it is you're going through right now that's causing you hurt and pain is not worth comparing to what lay ahead for you as a child of God. Regardless of whether or not that thing you're going through ever changes as you live your life on this earth. It's not worth comparing to what lay ahead for you as a child of God. Listen to what Paul said about that very thing in Romans chapter 18, verse chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, did Paul go through any sufferings in his life as a follower of Jesus? Read the book of Acts, right? Starting at chapter 9, going forward. Oh my. Most of us would have hightailed it the other way, had to go through some of those things. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of all creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. And it's been waiting for a couple thousand years now. God hears us when we cry out to Him. And as I said, if that was all the text said, it would be enough. But that's not all the text says. It says, second of all, not only that God hears, but God remembers. But don't stop there. Read the next two words. God remembers His covenant. Don't neglect those last two words. God remembers His covenant. In other words, God didn't remember Israel because they cried very loud and very long. God didn't remember Israel because they were the good guys and the Egyptians were the bad guys. Listen, church, there are no good guys. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There are no good guys. Israel is rescued and redeemed in spite of the fact that they're bad guys. In spite of the fact that they're sinners. They were neither innocent nor sinless. Nor did God owe them any deliverance. 
It was by the grace of God alone that he chose to deliver them. And that could be applied to any one of us. It is by the grace of God alone that any of us have been recipients of, of his great salvation. Through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now compare that to how we come to God when we feel hopelessness setting in. One of the reasons we're tempted to feel hopeless is because we often think to ourselves, even though we may not say it, that, well, I, I'm a pretty good person. So we begin to ask the question, so why am I going through this, God? I go to church. I don't do bad things. So why is this happening to me? You think some of the Hebrews may have thought that, if not said it, there in bondage in Egypt? If that's where you are, it's as though your theology has become, as long as I'm better, or by some margin, than the worst person I know, then things really ought to be going well for me. If that describes your thoughts, then I would say that you are trusting in your own goodness for your hope. And that's not a good place to be. What the Lord remembered was His own covenant. His own promised word. Which covenant? Which promised word? Well, if you went to Genesis chapter 15, that's a great chapter where God is talking to Abraham, okay? He's already promised Abraham that he would have a son and many descendants. And Abraham is beginning to have some question. <laughs> Lord, you know, Sarah and I, we're, we're getting kind of old now, and uh, we don't have any children at all. And you're still saying, I'm going to have descendants. And God says, yeah, come out here, Abraham. I want to show you something in the night sky. Look at all the stars. Can you name those stars? Can you number those stars? And Abraham's like, no, God. God says, you know, I can number them. I can name them. I created them. Your descendants, Abraham, will be more numerous than the stars in the sky. And to solidify that promise, that covenant, God did something very unique. He told Abraham to go and pick a couple of animals, different animals, and cut those animals in half. Cut them in two. Place one part of the animal over here on the right, one part of the animals over here on the left. And God says, I myself will walk through those animal parts, solidifying the covenant that I'm making with you, the promise that you will have multiple descendants. And that night, Abraham went into a deep sleep, and God, in the form of a smoking fire pot, moved in and out of those body parts. And what God was letting Abraham know was this, if I break my covenant with you, you can do to me what you have done to these animal parts. And you know that ain't going to happen. God keeps his promise. God keeps his covenant. Concerning those multiple descendants of Abraham, listen to what God says to him in Genesis 15 verse 13. God said, No certainly that your descendants, and he doesn't even have a one yet, your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. What land is he talking about? Egypt. And will serve the Egyptians. And the Egyptians will afflict them. How long? Four days? Four hundred years. That's a long time. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. And afterwards, they, the Hebrews, shall come out of Egypt with great possessions. And did they? <laughs> oh yeah. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And let me just say, and by the way, God remembering His covenant is nothing like you and I remembering something, okay? Have you ever had the situation where you walk into the house and there's one of your children or grandchildren or maybe your spouse and they're standing in front of you as you walk in with that look, you know? 
that look that immediately communicates to you that I'm supposed to be remembering something right now. God is never like that. Never. When it says that God remembered his covenant, what's being referred to here is not a God who is so busy, so consumed with upholding his universe that he has to go back over here and say, oh, oh wait just a minute. I forgot something. You guys are suffering. I'm so sorry. Can someone come over here and spin this universe while I go over here and take care of this problem? No. That's not what it means when it says that God remembered. That's not who our God is. All things, past, present, and future, are open and exposed to Him, and nothing can be hidden from Him. That's what the Bible teaches us. He is all-knowing. When we talk about God remembering His covenant, we're referring to God's providence. That God is actively working out all things in accordance to His will. Perfect timing. Now for Israel, that's great news. In a temporal sense, that's great news. They're in bondage in Egypt, they're slaves, and God remembering his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob would cause them to move from one land to another, from the land of bondage to the land of promise. But God remembering his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is far more involved than just getting his people from one land to another land on the earth. God's covenant is about him remembering his covenant of redemption. God's covenant with Abraham also implies that great promise, that great covenant of redemption, redeeming God's people from bondage, not from slavery, but from sin. That's great news. Because in his covenant of redemption, the God who created the world and all things in the world, who existed eternally before the world was ever created, has existed eternally before the world perfectly in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son nor the Spirit. And the Son is not the Father or the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father or the Son. Right, church? This is the doctrine of the Trinity. We believe in this. One God, three persons, existing in perfect unity, perfect harmony, perfect love within the Godhead, needing absolutely nothing or no one else. That's so important. Please don't miss that, because God needs nothing. If God needs something, that means he's deficient. And if God is deficient, he can't be God. God needs nothing. The unity in the Godhead, the harmony and the love is perfect. And that perfect love spilled over from the Godhead down upon his creation. And in God's covenant of redemption, the Father, out of love for the Son, gives or bequeaths to the Son, a people, a chosen people. You read about that very thing, that very conversation between the Son and the Father in John chapter 17. It's the Lord's Prayer. John 17, where Jesus is talking to the Father about the people you gave me. He's talking about you. He's talking about you and me, the people that you chose before the foundation of the world, God, that you gave me, and I lose none. So the Father gives a people to the Son, and the Son, out of His love for the Father, actually wraps Himself in human flesh, lives a perfect sinless life, dies the death that we sinners owe, so that He can, out of love for the Father, redeem those people the Father gave Him, back to the Father before the world was created. But wait, there's more than that. Because the Spirit, who is not the Father or the Son, 
but is perfect, but is a perfect expression of the love between the Father and the Son. And because of the love between the Father and the Son, does his work of applying redemption to all of those for whom the Son died, the very ones that the Father gave him. That's God's covenant of redemption. And for that church, we are grateful that God remembers. So whatever it is you're going through, know this. God remembers His covenant. And God redeems His people. That's why the Bible does not say, when God finally got around to it, He remembered to send His Son. No. What the Bible does say, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a virgin, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive the adoption as sons. Amen? God remembers. There's a third word that brings hope. God sees. God sees His people. In the midst of our hopelessness, when we forget that God is our only hope, We begin to look around for other things and in other places. We forget that God sees us in the midst of trouble we're going through. So we need to be reminded of this truth over and over again. Now there's some who don't want to be reminded of this truth that God sees. They don't want to know that God sees everything that they're doing in life. You may be one of those people today. I hope not. But in the midst of our pain and suffering, how comforting it is to know, church, that God sees me. When that cancer diagnosis came, God was watching. When that rebellious son or daughter chose to run away, God was watching. When that slander or mistreatment that you've been receiving at work or at school came, God saw it. When that loved one, that soulmate, died, God saw that too. And again, there may be some thinking, well, that doesn't sound very hopeful. That God saw it. That's what you're thinking. Then that's just simply because you haven't considered the alternative. The alternative is that we serve and worship a God who misses things. As opposed to a God who sees all things, knows all things, and works all things together for our good, for His glory. The alternative is absolutely unbearable. The idea that there are moments in my life where God does not see. The idea that there are times in my life when God is not able to be my hope. And therefore, I have to trust in someone or something else to be my hope because, well, here's the sad reality. If God can't see and intervene in our situation, who else do we have? When Israel was in bondage, God saw. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, which implies that today or any day, when your darkest day comes, God will see it because He is the God who sees His people. Finally, God acknowledged. God acknowledged them. Other translations you uh, interpret that word as God was concerned about His people. God understood His people. I like the definition, God knows. God knows. God knows what? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a picture here of both love and pity of God knowing. You see, God knows intimately. 
He knows what circumstances will bring him the most glory. He knows how you can bear. He knows what you really need. And he knows that your deliverance is coming. Simply because the God who knows is the God who delivers. So where was God during all of this time? Where was God for the hundreds of years that the Hebrews were going through suffering and bondage and slavery? Where was God at on your darkest day? Where was God when you needed Him the most? The answer is, He was in the same place He was when He saw His Son crushed and crucified for your sins. He was where He was. High upon His throne, being our only hope. He's the one who hears. He's the one who remembers His covenant. He's the one who sees His children. He's the one who knows. I want to conclude by going back to that passage in Psalms 115. I only read half of the verse, or the psalm. I want to go back and read the rest of Psalm 115, beginning in verse Nine. I left off of verse 8 where it says, those who make idols become like them and so do those who trust in them. And by the way, anything you're trusting in, hoping in other than God is your idol. Verse 9. O Israel, trust in the Lord, for He is your help and your shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord, for He is your hope and your shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is your help and your shield. The Lord has been merciful to us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear Him, both great and small. How can He do this? Because He is the God who hears His people when they cry, who remembers His covenant, who sees His children, and who knows. And church, all of this, the culmination of all of this is all wrapped up in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. You see, when Israel cried out to God, they had no idea that their deliverer was already being prepared and on the way. They didn't know it. Had no idea. As a matter of fact, years would pass before their deliverance would come. And it's possible that as every day passed, they were tempted to think, or at least maybe say, God has forgotten us. God has forgotten us. Those scoffers are still around today, aren't they? Well, listen, church, because we have the blessing and the benefit of hindsight, we can answer their statement, no, he hasn't forgotten you. No, He hasn't forgotten you. Because we know the rest of the story, right? For God so loved the world that He gave us His only begotten Son, the great Deliverer. And whosoever will believe in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Christ is our only hope. And because of that, church, we we need look nowhere else. Amen? Father, help us. Help us to apply this truth to our lives. Not only today, as we sit comfortably in this church house, But for some, as they leave today, it may become their darkest day. 
and they begin, may begin to be tempted with the feelings of the, there's no hope. There's no hope. Remind them of this biblical truth of who you are and who we are in Christ. Help us each day, Lord, to place our hope in Jesus and in Him alone. In His name we pray. Amen and amen. As we have our time of invitation, some music's being played, songs being sung. That's important because it's giving you an opportunity to respond to the word you've heard this morning. Not my words, but his word. If you've never trusted in Christ alone for your salvation, do it today. He's your only hope. He's your only hope. And I trust that many of you have already done that. As a Christian, may this message be a reminder of the hope that you have in Christ each and every day. Maybe you simply want to just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. As we stand and sing our invitation, how might you need to respond to him? Hymn number 15, we'll sing the first and last verse together. Come thou fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never cease, songs of loudest praise, teach me some Mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. with you. You'll continue to be in my heart in prayers as you search for your next pastor. Let's bow and dismiss in a word of prayer. I want before morning. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for bringing the word of God this morning. That was a wonderful message, great challenge. The word's been given, and now it's up to us how we're going to receive it. Uh, amen. Um, Haley, at this time, would you come forward? We've we've got someone this morning that would like to be brought forward as a candidate for membership of Troy First Baptist Church, Haley McLeod, and 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 you know what? I'm going to let her. Uh, I'm going to let Bradley come up here with her. She has been baptized. Um, she is currently uh, a member at Laurel Hill, so we just have to get that transferred. But I'd like to bring her uh, up as a candidate if anyone would like to make a motion for membership for Haley. Second. All opposed. Likewise. Haley, welcome to our family. I've got a chance to get to know Haley for a while and, and youth, and now I'm sad to say they've graduated youth, but they still help out as leaders. And uh, this is very a very special couple to me, and they do so much for the church, and I'm so glad to have Bradley's better half now helping them out because he needs it.
No, they're both great, wonderful people. And uh, if you would, when we dismiss, just come up and let them know how much you love them and appreciate them. I know how much they mean to me and this church. Okay, with that, everyone have a great week and go out and serve the Lord. You're dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.